Uh, my name is George Nee, I'm from Team Magmo, and I'm going to talk to you today about driving adoption with a network of virtual payment channels. So, um, quick outline, I'm going to talk to you about the team, the problem we're trying to solve, what our solution is, spoiler alert, it's virtual payment channels, uh, the progress we've made, and how you can get involved. So, as I mentioned, um, I'm from Team Magma. We've got some other team members here today, Colin and Alex, in the front row here. Um, you can check out all of our information on magmo.com. We are uh, inside of Consensus Mesh and very happy to be supported by the Farcoin Foundation. Uh, so we're a team of software developers, researchers, problem solvers, and we specialize in state channels and payment channels. Um, and yeah, I mentioned we're problem solvers. What's the problem we're trying to solve? Well. What we want to do is drive adoption, particularly of Web3 protocols, by allowing for better incentivization for participants. So how do we incentivize people? Well, I believe that service providers should be getting paid by users. Um, and that's not currently happening, and it's not happening enough. And I think it's a necessary step to give the retrieval market, for example, for it to live up to its name. And here's another quote from Juan on Monday. He said, users will select convenience. So better incentivization for us means more convenience for the user. It means lower latency and lower cost for the transactions they want to make. And that's where our technology can come in. So here's a diagram I stole from Patrick. Credit to him for making a nice diagram. Um, it shows the Farquhar ecosystem, I suppose. And yeah, our thesis is that if we had a low cost, low friction way to send Farcoin around, then we would really be turbocharging these markets. Um, but we need to do that in a way, obviously, that's trust minimized and scalable. We're not about to install some centralized service to make this nice. We've got to keep all the powerful decentralization properties that we know and love in Web3. So one way of doing that, and this is actually an existing mechanism that you will find inside the Farcoin spec, is to use micropayments. And they are an amazing way of minimizing trust. Obviously, there's different mechanisms for minimizing trust. But I believe micropayments is a very general way of doing it, as particularly for things like retrieval. So how does it work? You have um, a service provider on the left there and a service consumer on the right. You could call them the payee and the payer or the provider and the client. Names don't really matter too much. And in this example, um, the service provider is streaming bits of a file to this consumer, and in return, they're streaming money back in the other direction. And why does this help minimize trust? Well, if the service provider stops providing the service, stops sending the files, then this guy can just stop sending the money, and vice versa. If you're not getting paid, you just stop doing the service. So it's a kind of soft way of verifying the service. You don't have to do any cryptographic proof or anything like that, and that's what makes it very widely applicable, particularly to services which are provided sort of continuously which retrieval is one of, those, one of those use cases. So could you do micropayments on chain on L1? Not really, but like if you tried, it would look a bit like this. So we've got our, um, oh, this is not very visible, is it? But we've got three actors up here, the payee, the payer with the star, and the L1 blockchain. Could be Farcoin, Mainnet, could be Wallaby, if it was working. Um, and yeah, this was how it would look like. For one retrieval deal, you could um, send money. Um, I've, I've chosen to split this deal into four payments. In reality, you might want to do 100 or 1,000 payments and make them really granular to reduce that amount of trust. If you like, the more payments you have per deal, the less trust you need, which is what we're shooting for. And if you did this on the chain, as I said, it would be super painful. You'd, each payment, you'd have to wait at least one block time about 30 seconds, it's in big, bold red letters there that that is painful and it is expensive and that's not what we want to do. It's so painful and expensive that you just wouldn't use micropayments, right? You just wouldn't go there. So how about what I call vanilla payment channels? This, this is very close to um, also what you'll find in the Farcoin spec on payment channels. It, it's not quite as good as the Farcoin payment channels, but it gives you an idea. So what happens here is the payer puts all of the money that they are willing to spend in total onto the chain in a special contract or a special actor. And then off chain, they send signed vouchers um, directly to the payee, and that is incredibly low latency operation, um, as many times as they like. 
And when that interaction is finished, maybe the retrieval deal has been completed, the payee, the retrieval provider, if you like, can take the best voucher that they received, take it back to the chain, unlock the money, and they've been paid. Um, and let's say the retrieval deal stopped halfway through. Then maybe they only get half of the money. And that's, that's the, the beauty of micropayments. So you can see the separation in time scales here. We've gone from something that takes 30 seconds down to something which I'm claiming can be done on a few milliseconds time scale. And we've got another talk directly after this one from Alex, and he's going to go into some depth about trying to see if the numbers that I'm uh, parroting out are actually accurate and uh, lived up to by our software that we're building. So our solution is better. Like, that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm here to convince you of. Um, so there's still a problem with what I just showed. There's a lot of pain and cost, even with these kind of payment channels, these vanilla flavored ones. If we go back a slide, um, you'll see here that per retrieval deal, each of these actors, the payee and the payer, still has to make a transaction on the blockchain. They've still got to wait. They've still got to pay the fees. And it turns out that's not necessary. So the way you get around this is you leverage existing state channels or existing payment channels. I kind of use those terms interchangeably today um, to enable you to do payments off-chain uh, without ever touching the chain. And there are two main solutions we know about for that. One is called hash time-locked contract uh, payment channels. And many of you will know about those from the Bitcoin Lightning Network, which is a very successful way of sending payments. And there's what we do, which is virtual channel networks. And our system is called Nitro. And I'm going to try and convince you that it's even better than HTLCs. So HTLCs work. This is a very busy diagram, but don't worry about it too much. Um, Alice wants to pay Eric and has no connection to Eric with a payment channel. But Alice is connected to Bob, Bob to Carol, Carol to Diana, Diana to Eric. And they can actually send a payment from Alice to Eric using that existing um, connectivity. So how it works is Alice sends a payment to Bob, Bob sends one to Carol, and so on. And all of those payments are locked up with the same secret. And when all of those payments have gone through but they haven't been unlocked yet, Eric can start unwinding this. And he announces the secret and everybody's payments go through atomically. That's the idea. And so Alice has effectively paid Eric. Um, you know, a little bit of money has gone that way, that way, that way, that way, and it ends up where it should be. So that is um, really powerful. And as I say, it's in use in the Bitcoin Lightning Network. And the kernel of that um, functionality is inside Firecoin payment channels right now. So that is a direction that we could go in. But our team is suggesting something a bit different, which is this virtual channel idea. So how do virtual channels work? Here's another complicated diagram. Don't worry, I'm going to walk you through it. So the way virtual channels work is you're going to treat those existing channels like mini blockchains, or maybe we could use the word subnet. Might be a piece of terminology. It'll be interesting to chat to people about that. That have extremely fast confirmation times. So what we do is we fund new channels from existing ones. So you see this top layer here. We have channels L, M, and R. Those are the regular channels which are funded by deposits on the chain. Okay, And they allocate money to Alice. I1 and I2 are intermediaries, and Bob these are the people who want to have a direct connection, but don't. Obviously, um, A and I1 are connected. I1 and I2 are connected. I2 and B are connected. So it's very similar to that HCLC scenario in terms of the connectivity that exists. It's a, just a different kind of diagram to, to, to um, describe the same situation. And what we do is we just divert money. Instead of just giving money to the people in the channel, we now give money to a new channel V which exists entirely off-chain. And these black lines mean that that channel will pay out to these parties. And the dashed line, it's very similar. It's just a special kind of allocation that we need to do in our system to make this safe. If you can imagine these lines get plumbed in in different orders, we need to make sure that if it stops halfway through, it's all still safe. That's probably more detail than you need. The main takeaway from this slide is that virtual channels exist entirely off-chain, and they're funded by existing channels. And the big advantage they have is that they're going to scale better. So back to HDLCs, just as comparison. It's a similar diagram as before. We've got the payee, the payer, and the blockchain. But now we've got this new party, the intermediary. 
Um, and they're there to help people do payments. So now we have to deposit in to the chain, and that's the payer and the intermediary. They're entering a state channel network now. They're not concerned with the retrieval deal yet. They're just setting up um, the system. Then when a retrieval deal starts in, a, in an HTLC system, the payer, like I said before, is going to send money to the intermediary, and the intermediary is going to send it to the payee. And that should happen atomically using the, um, the hash locks. And that can happen many times. Um, and that's really nice because you can do many of these retrieval deals without going back to the chain. Um, you could connect to a different retrieval provider entirely. So the same payer, the same payer can connect to a different payee as long as they're connected mutually to the, an intermediary, or potentially connected through several hops through several intermediaries. Um, and they don't need to go back to the chain until they want to get their money out and use it for something completely different unrelated to payments. So that's super nice, but the main problem with it that we're going to get around is this intermediary is like doing a ton of work. Um, we want to build a really scalable state channel network, and here, if you recall, we're doing micropayments, and we want to do as many micropayments as possible to reduce trust. So if we want to do multiple micropayments per second, then the intermediary has got a lot of load on them. They're processing a lot of messages. They're doing uh, crypto, like signing um, hashes and things like that, and that's not great. So with a virtual channel construction, it looks like this. Very similar. Again, the payer and the intermediary have entered the state channel network by depositing their funds early on. That's completely separate from retrieval deals. And then when they decide that they want to participate in a retrieval deal, the payer and the payee and the intermediary, they execute this sort of, it's not really a black box, it's a green box, but it's a box that I'm not telling you how it works, but it's an off-chain protocol that they run, that we've designed, which enables them to fund that new virtual channel off-chain. And once that's happened, the intermediary can completely step out of the picture. They can get on with some other work. They can get on with connecting other payee, payer pairs. And now the, the, the payments are like back to the original story almost. They're direct. They go straight from the service consumer to the service provider. We can do them very high frequency and have very low trust. And again, once it's um, finished, we can unwrap with a virtual defund protocol and go and do more retrieval deals. And we only need to go back to the chain very, very infrequently. So this virtual fund protocol is where all of our cleverness, all of our complexity lives. And Alex is going to talk a bit later on about how fast this may or may not be at the moment with our current iteration of our software. My claim is that it's around 100 milliseconds. So if we think back to what Harm was saying earlier about um, content delivery networks and having great experience for the user, we obviously don't want payment channels to slow everything down. So I think we're kicking around the right kind of numbers here, bearing in mind that we've still got headroom to improve this, to integrate payments without slowing the whole CDN down. So I think that's quite exciting. So um, if you want to know the real details of what I just said, look inside that green box. You can go to our brand new uh, documentation website, docs.statechannels.org. We're quite pleased with this. It's got a lot of detail. It has FAQs, code snippets, diagrams, and more. So please check that out if you're interested. Um, and now I'm going to switch to talking about progress towards this, this dream of virtual payment channels. So some things we've, we've, we've gotten over the line very recently. Um, we've finished our on-chain implementation. So those are contracts written in Solidity that we've been working on for a long time. We had some help from colleagues at Yellow who are building um, financial trading platform. They helped us build out the on-chain component. And one thing I'd like to highlight here is that um, I've got a big picture of gas over here. And what we like to do in our team is um, every time we make a, a change to the on-chain implementation of our system, we check in important gas consumption numbers alongside it. And that is enforced by our continuous integration checks. So at any given time, we can tell you exactly how expensive it's going to be to do a deposit to withdraw your funds from the state channel network, or even to walk the unhappy path and retrieve your funds when things go wrong. So that's something that's um, pretty important to us. We've spent time, again, trying to drive costs down for the user by optimizing our source code. And it will be really interesting, I'm going to talk in a minute about the FVM, uh, the Filecoin virtual machine, to see how these numbers change and to see if there's any interesting um, 
increases or decreases in cost as we move from like a pure EVM chain to a Farpoint virtual machine. Another big thing that we've been working on, which is like um, almost finished, I would say, is our off-chain Go Nitro client. So this is a piece of software. It's a library really written in Go. You can see the API there. It's designed to um, look after your whole state channel story. So it has API methods like um, create ledger channel, which is our name for um, your initial deposit into the system. And it has another API method called create virtual channel. And when you call that method, our client software will do all of the stuff behind the scenes to set that up, send messages around. It will look after your state channel signing keys and your important information. And when we've built out um, the persistent storage part of our system, even if your laptop crashes, you're not going to lose money because your, your information will be restored safely. What I've shown on the right here is um, an interesting execution trace. It looks a little bit like those diagrams I showed you before. And this is something that we generated by instrumenting our code to see if it was doing what we thought it was doing. So we can see messages being passed between various actors here. And the good news is it, it went mostly to plan. Um, in terms of thinking about the correctness of what we're doing, again, I'll refer you to Alex's talk, which is coming up, where we've really kind of ramped up how um, we're trying to battle test our system and make sure it behaves the way we want it to. Another uh, big win we had recently is um, we wrote a research paper in collaboration with the Perun team, now called Polycrypt. These were the guys who invented virtual channels, and they helped us um, refine them even further into what I've just told you about today. And one of the important refinements was what we call a flat, multi-hop virtual channel. So it's a, it's a simple story with a single intermediary when you want to set up a virtual channel. When you've got more intermediaries, you need to route through multi-hop payments. The very naive way of doing it that we knew about until recently was to set up a kind of recursive system. So you've got existing um, connections here, and you use those to set up virtual channels, and then you use those virtual channels as the previous layer, and you keep going on. And the problem with that is you end up with a lot of channels, a lot of connections, and it's costly and um, not very nice to use. And in this paper, which is called SATP for Stateful Asset Transfer Protocol, Simple and Scalable Protocol. We flattened that all out. So we can have a really lightweight, lean construction now for multi-hop payments. And I'm pleased to say, not only have we figured out the theory for this, we've actually implemented it in our client code and we've tested it. And it works surprisingly well. Um, and again, Alex will tell you more about that. So kind of stoked to get that working. Um, and Colin actually put in a big effort to um, engineer that in the last few weeks. So thanks to him. Another big win um, that we did recently was integrating with FVM. So we just had that amazing talk from Sarah. And um, here's my picture of plugging state channels into the Wallaby testnet, which is the leading edge of um, FEVM development. And it doesn't work today, but it did work a few days ago, um, which was amazing. And we will get it working in due time. And um, it's amazing, because we, we were kind of a Ethereum native team until recently. And what the FEVM promises and offers to us is to take our existing code, not do too much hard work, and just stick it on Farcoin, which is what we need to get Farcoin flying around the place. So here's a couple of screenshots um, explaining that in a little bit more detail. So we have something we call the FEVM chain service. Now, our software works with injected dependencies, so it's very easy for us to swap in and out chain services for different backends, Ethereum, Farcoin, other systems. So we just wrote a new chain service, and we plugged it in. And it mostly worked, which was amazing. Um, and the long-term long sort of uh, goal is to actually get rid of this FEVM chain service. Because as Sarah said, um, you know, the Farcoin virtual machine, in time, will look completely transparent, we hope, and look just like another Ethereum endpoint. So we won't have to even worry about it being Farcoin. It'll look just like Ethereum to us. But in the meantime, before that, before we get to those sunlit uplands, we've had to put in a few shims and workarounds um, to get stuff working. So if you're thinking of doing a similar kind of thing, deploying to Wallaby in, in, in the short term, please get in touch with us, because we've built up a little bit of experience now with working around some of the quirks. So as an example of that, um, events are not something that 
are currently supported. And our system relies on events. We need um, our Go Nitro software to watch the chain and pick up events like deposits and things like that. That's not currently supported, so we built a little shim for it. So instead of listening for events, we just pull the chain and we say, What's, how much money is on chain against this channel? And when we see that change, we can, we can move forward. So that's a little shim we built that worked really well. Um, and Mike Kersner, who's not with us uh, at the moment, unfortunately, um, deserves a lot of credit for getting that to work. So yes, um, here's our kind of proof that it was working a few days ago. Um, this at the back here is a, uh, logs from our test runs. Um, they won't make a lot of sense to you, but they make sense to us, and it shows uh, our full end-to-end -end system working on Filecoin Wallaby testnet. And just as proof of that, we've shown the um, Glyph Block Explorer here, and you can see our deposits going in to um, our contracts that we have successfully deployed. So very, very pleased about that. Yes, and I'm getting towards the end of the presentation now, and I'd just like to point out the things that we need to do next to get really um, ready for integration with, with some of the people in this room, I hope. So still a few things that we need to work on. We need to work on cheaply rebalancing collateral in the network. Um, if you're kind of switched on, you'll realize that all the money at the moment is going to flow from clients to providers, and the clients will have no money left to do payments, and the providers will want to extract their money. At the moment, that is still a bit of a painful, slow process. So we're going to try and smooth that out and make it easy to rebalance the collateral. Uh, walking the unhappy path. So in state channels and payment channels, the main problem you come across is when the people you're interacting with go offline. And what we have to have is a recovery mechanism for that, which involves going back to the chain. Um, and that is all implemented on chain, but it's not implemented off chain in our software. So we need to get that working. We're looking at crash tolerance, as I mentioned before, and data persistence. We're looking into fee models for intermediaries. I've kind of waved my hands and introduced this intermediary who's doing things for free at the moment, but in order for it to be a properly incentivized system, they need to extract fees from the other parties. And that's something we're working on. We need a better, nicer API for people to interact with, and we're looking at things like multi-asset support. So that's all ongoing. How can you get involved in what we're doing? Well, if you're building something in this ecosystem, retrieval provider or client, or you're building another application you think might benefit from uh, virtual payment channels, or you just like to contribute to our project in any way, we'd love to hear from you, so reach out on my email address here, please. Um, and that's really the next stage of our journey, is finding um, people like that to integrate with and to use our tech and to bring payments to what you're doing. The other thing I'd like to mention is we have a job opening at the moment for a uh, software engineer. So you could join the team if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, check out our website for more details. Uh, that is the end of my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, uh, it's Andreas from Legacy again. Uh, so when you make the, or you know, when the person makes a deposit, where exactly does the money go? And are there any regulatory implications? Because uh, essentially you're an escrow service, right, for that money, and you, yes. and you do transaction behalf of the client. Um, so I could just imagine that somebody has to say something and you need a license for that. Have, have you looked into that? Um, we've not looked into the licensing. I'm not sure I fully got your question, but I think the question is, where does the money go when you're depositing on chain? Broad question, right? Where, where does yeah. the money go, right? When you deposit, you know, where, yes. so it's basically who provides the escrow service? Yes. Is that the smart contract, or is that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely a smart contract. Um, so in our system, we have a singleton contract which we deploy as a team, um, so these users don't have, need to worry about it. We call it the adjudicator contract and it will hold all of the funds for all of the on-chain channels in the entire system. And we spent a long time securing that, making it um, uh, you know, safe, safe to deposit into, and, and thinking about under which conditions the money can be released. Um, so it's a non-custodial system. It's fully trustless smart contract that manages that. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that's understood, but then the so you haven't really looked into the regulatory question, right? If you need some licenses from, you know, in Germany, it would be Bafin or, you know, I don't know, depending on what country you're in, uh, you may need to 
be licensed to do financial services like this? That's a really interesting question. We've not thought a, a whole bunch about it. Um, and I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> But um, we, you know, I'd, ho I'd hope that because we're not actually being custodians of the money ourselves, we wouldn't have to worry about that. What we can do um, if we were worried about it is there are other architectures where we put the escrow contract in the hands of the users. And they can, that's how Filecoin payment channels work a bit more like that. So there's a new contract for every interaction. And the infrastructure team, us, is just totally not part of it. We provide the code. We don't do any deployments. Um, but we, we like the singleton architecture better because it's got better gas cost implications. And maybe a follow-up question. So instead of making a deposit, have you thought about uh, to provide credit? So I mean, if you have sort of a long-running system, right, then you know about the relationships between clients and uh, uh, providers, and yes. so you could probably provide credit there. Yeah, that's really interesting. That is something we think about. Um, so there's a couple points there, I think. There's capital inefficiency problems with what we're doing in a sense, like there's a lot of capital locked up and it's not always being put to good use. Um, this is something that Colin has been thinking about on our team. So we've got a few ideas of putting the capital to work more. And, and, and related to that is, as you say, we've kind of built really a zero trust system at the moment. So that means a lot of capital needs to be locked up because we have really powerful invariants like you can always get your money back irrespective of the actions of any other party. It's a very strong statement, requires a lot of capital to be locked up. If we were willing to relax that a little bit, as you say, using a little bit more trust, building up relationships, then, then we can improve the story. We can lower the capital requirements, we can reduce fees. Um, but that, that's a judgment call about how the trade-off you want to make between trust and, and efficiency. Yes. Hey, thank you for the presentation. Uh, tons of questions. One. If you could tell me what are the aspects you do specifically to make it safe, like I'd love to know any details on that. And then the second one is, when it comes to custodial like abilities, does the virtual channel act as a custodian of, like, of either token, smart contract, et cetera? And like, do you connect into most custodial services, digital asset providers, like any detail of how you can connect into multiple different digital asset, like either holders or services, would, would help. OK, thanks. Yeah. Uh, how, what do we do to make the system safe? Um, we've done a bunch of stuff on the on-chain side. Um, so we've done things like um, TLA plus modeling. You may not know about that, but it, it's a kind of uh, exhaustive um, testing framework where we can look at things like front running and, and really check that different um, on-chain transactions coming in different orders don't lead to unexpected problems with our contracts. Um, previous revisions of our contracts have been security audited by consensus diligence. So that's another option we have for making the whole system secure. Um, your other question was about um, custody again. So really what I would say is that that smart contract is the custodian of the on-chain funds. And the individual actors using our software or, or anyone else who wants to build software to our specification, they're the custodians of the secrets and the keys that can be used to unlock the funds on chain. So there's, there's no real other custodians in the picture. You hold on to your um, vouchers, your payment vouchers, for example. You can use those to unlock funds on chain. Uh, does that answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sort of a little bit because a lot of times, especially from the regulatory perspective too, the actual owner of the asset, let's just say you had co-located funds with someone that was in terrorist financing or something like that, right? Yeah. If someone were to go to you and say, hey, I just I cut my, my, uh, my funds in Magmo and you know, they were the custodian, would you be held liable? Would the user be held liable? Like, where does the liability really come to or go to? Yeah, I'll answer this real quick and then I think we might have to wrap up. But like, as I said before, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't really know, but I would like to think that because we don't have any power of custody, the custody is in the power of individual users and the smart contract code being written correctly, I would hope that we wouldn't be in hot water for that. Um, yeah, but we, we can talk more about that in the break, maybe. Thanks for your question.